I suspect that all of you will fully understand why I say what I'm about to say. You know, I've been at this, coming up to these podiums for a long time, and it is extraordinarily rare that um, I feel um, nervous and kind of overwhelmed, especially with someone that I that I get to introduce, but I will, I will confess to everybody, that is exactly how I feel right now. <laughs> now, now, for those of you who have attended NTEU legislative conferences in the past, I suspect it would not be any surprise whatsoever if I said that we are honored to have with us today a senior member and subcommittee chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Now, after all, you know, the work of this powerful committee touches many of the agencies whose employees are represented by NTEU. Now, because of his work on that committee, NTEU has had the tremendous privilege of working closely with today's very special guest, where he has been a great friend and a wise counselor to NTEU. Now, typically, it would be quite enough if I were to just simply say what I've already said about a distinguished speaker. But for our guest today, Congressman John Lewis of Georgia, <laughs> that really is just one very small por uh, part of his incredible life story. Now, Congressman John Lewis was born in the Deep South when African Americans suffered from segregation and disenfranchisement. Inspired by the Montgomery bus boycott and the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., he organized sit-ins at segregated lunch counters, participated in the Freedom Rides challenging segregation of bus terminals across the South co-founded and led the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and was a speaker at the historic 1963 March on Washington. 54 years ago this very week, on March 7th, 1965, John Lewis led over 600 peaceful, orderly protesters, including many clergy and labor leaders across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. They intended to march from Selma to Montgomery to demonstrate the need for voting rights. The marchers were attacked by Alabama state troopers in a brutal confrontation forever known as Bloody Sunday. This senseless cruelty awakened the, con the conscience of a nation and led to the enactment of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The labor movement stood with John Lewis on that bridge in Alabama, and I'm here to tell you today that NTEU and every other part of the American labor movement will stand with John Lewis every day of his life as he continues the quest for voting rights, equality for all, and social justice. And I want you to know that I am incredibly honored and I'm proud to be able to introduce a man of incredible courage and honor, a man who occupies a truly sacred space in our nation's history, a man who was an inspiration to me and I know an inspiration to all of you, please join me in welcoming Congressman John Lewis. Good morning. 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Good morning. You're a good looking group. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. I'm honored, delighted, and very pleased to be here with each and every one of you as members of NTU. I want to thank you for all of your great work. Thank you for never giving up, for never giving in, for keeping the faith and keeping your eyes on the prize. I know during the past few weeks, for some of you, more than just a few weeks, but it uh, hasn't been easy. A national government, in so many different ways, has been so kind to some of you. But you're hung in there, and you must continue to hang in there. Now you heard the president, Mr. President, thank you for those kind words, said that I grew up in a rural Alabama 50 miles from Montgomery. I'd start of a little place called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, I really do, my father had saved $300. With the $300, a man sold him 110 acres of land. We still own this land today. <laughs> on this farm, there is a lot of cotton and corn, hogs, cows, and chicken. Some of you may know that when I was a little boy growing up on the farm, I wanted to be a minister. I fell in love with raising chickens. Any of you know anything about raising chicken? Why don't we compare notes? <laughs> well, when the setting hen was set, I would take the fresh eggs and mark them with a pencil and place them under the setting hen and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you may be saying, now, John Lewis, why don't you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest. There would be some more fresh eggs. And you had to be able to tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Do you follow me? It's OK you don't follow me. <laughs> so when the little chick would hatch, I would fool these setting hens. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen. Get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, Place them under the setting hen, and the curse of setting hen, they stole the nest for another three weeks. It's not the right thing to do. It's not the moral thing. It's not the most loving thing to do. It's not the most nonviolent thing to do. But I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator from the Susan Roebuck store. Any of you old enough or know anything about the Susan Roebuck catalog? <laughs> that big book? A heavy book, thick book. Some people call it the ordering book. Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had it. I just kept on wishing. But as a little child, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and first cousin would line the outside of the chicken yard. And I would start preaching to the chickens. <laughs> and when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bow their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said in, amen. <laughs> but I'm convinced that some of, the, of those chickens tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today in the Congress. <laughs> and, and, and some of those chickens were just a little more productive. <laughs> at, at least they produce eggs. Now, we're living in a difficult time. But you cannot give up. You cannot become bitter. You cannot become hostile. You got to keep the faith and keep your eyes on the prize. Every day, not just one day, but every day, 
We have to bring our people together and redeem the soul of America and create for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. call the beloved community. We can do it and we must do it. As, as members of this great organization, you know what to do. And you know how to do it. And I want to thank you for all of your help and for all of your support. When I was growing up, I saw those signs that said, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I asked my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why? They were said, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But in 1955, 15 years old, I heard the Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on the old radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words of Dr. King, and the movement in Montgomery, Alabama, 48 miles from my home, inspired me to find a way to get in the way, to get in trouble what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. <laughs> and now is the time for, for union, for organized workers, for the American people to get in good trouble, necessary trouble, to save our country, save democracy. We can do better, and we must do better. Continue to be hopeful. Continue to be optimistic. And never let anything get you down. During the 60s, I got arrested a few times. <laughs> Forty-five times. <laughs> and since I've been in Congress during the past few years, another five times. So I said to you, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have an obligation, a moral obligation to say something, to do something. You cannot afford to be quiet. The American people are depending on you. Our children and our grandchildren are depending on us to stand up, to speak up and to speak out and hold on, a change is going to come. Amen. Just think of two short years in America. I first came to Washington, D.C. so many years ago. 21 years old, May 1961, going something called a Freedom Ride. Started right here, back in 1961, during the days of President Kennedy and his brother, the Attorney General Robert Kennedy, black people and white people couldn't be seated together on a Greyhound bus leaving this city. To travel through Virginia, through North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, we were on our way to New Orleans to test the decision of the United States Supreme Court. My seatmate was a young white gentleman from Connecticut when we left here, we went through Virginia without any real problems. A young man was arrested in Charlotte, North Carolina for trying to get a shoe shine at a so-called white barber shop. My seatmate was a young white gentleman. We arrived in Rock Hill, South Carolina and started into a waiting room we were attacked by members of the Klan, beaten and left lying in a pool of blood. This was May 1961. Many years later, one of the men who attacked us came to my office on Capitol Hill and said, Mr. Lewis came with his son, gentleman was in his 70s, son maybe in his late 30s, early 40s, he said, I've been a member of the Klan. I beat you. I left you bloody. I want to apologize. Will you forgive me? His son started crying. He started crying. I said, I forgive you. He gave me a hug. I hugged him back. I saw this gentleman four other times. 
Hope I had a reunion of the Freedom Riders. 400 of us were on her show. Never, never give up on anyone. Be willing to forgive and move on. That's what the movement was all about. NTU, you have the power to help save America. You have the power to redeem the soul of America and create the beloved community. You can do it. Continue in your work. I serve on the Ways and Means Committee, the Oversight Committee. We have oversight over the IRS. So we see a lot of other officials of our IRS to come up and testify. I'm going back to a hearing in a few minutes on Capitol Hill, dealing with how we're going to pay for in infrastructure and building bridges and roads for part of our country. Look like a third world country. We can do better. We have to save this little piece of real estate we call America for generations yet unborn. With your support and your help, we can do it. We must do it. So don't give up. Keep the faith. I remember growing up on that farm in rural Alabama. We had an aunt named Seneva who lived a few doors away. My brothers and sisters and a few of my first cousins were playing in her dirt yard. An unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, and the lightning started flashing. She got us all on the inside of a shotgun house. I know most of you are so sophisticated, you don't even know what a shotgun house is. <laughs> this old house, one way in, one way out. We were in this old house. My aunt came terrified. The wind continued to blow, the thunder continued to roll, the lightning continued to flash. And when it appeared that one corner of this old house was lifting, my aunt had us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, she had us to walk to that corner. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never left the house. As federal employees, as citizens of America, you must never leave the house. You must do what you can to hold our little trimming house down. And help save America. Our children, and generation yet unborn, but depending on us. What you do every single day, you may feel like it's not important. It doesn't matter. It does matter. It is important. So hang in there. Keep the faith. Keep your eyes on the prize. It's all going to work out. If somebody told me when I was walking across a bridge in Selma, Alabama, 54 years ago. Left bloody and unconscious. Had a concussion. Thought I saw death. That one day I would be standing here as a member of Congress. Been elected by the good people of Georgia for so many years. I would say, you crazy? <laughs> you out of your mind? You don't know what you're talking about. You, all of us, have a moral obligation. Continue to give our children and their children a way in and a way out. Thank you so much.